Um, did the president cave to the pressure? Yeah. Because a lot of people are saying part well, of the reason why it went wrong this week with the messaging is because Steve Banning was advising him yeah. to not uh, disavow that part so of the, the supporters. exact reporting from the New York Times is that the president told senior aides that he has decided to remove Steve Bannon. Um, well, there, there, well, I knew mean, from earlier today that the chief of staff, uh, John Kelly, John Kelly, was looking at you know whether or not this was going to be something that they would do, and I'm trying to find the exact reporting that we had on that. But but anyway, this was something that they were looking at, and you know we even saw, and I, I saw this written about a little while ago, a little blip on the screen of the Dow Jones on the stock market this morning as this discussion yeah. was being reported uh, and whether and whether or not that was kind yeah, the of the Dow has been in, move, in negative territory yeah, and now it's moving move in positive things territory. back into positive territory if they got rid of Steve Bannon so that was a discussion that was being reported on and if in fact this was in reaction to what's happened all week long what mm -hmm. does that tell us Kennedy it tells us that the president's three reactions to Charlottesville uh, Charlottesville show a rift within the White House. John Kelly came in. Uh, he's been a very decisive chief of staff. We've seen reports that not only Steve Bannon perhaps leaked uh, some of the biggest stories out of the White House, but also that his relationship uh, with the president has grown very, very frosty. And the fact that he had the counter reaction that he did on Tuesday, uh, that further exposed the rift. And I said Monday on the show that Steve Bannon was not going to last through the week, that Charlottesville would be his death knell. Because so, there, to be clear, though, the reporting says uh, that he had submitted his resignation to the president dating back to August 7th, which per my calendar, that would have been last Monday, mm -hmm. about two weeks ago. Um, they were still having discussions as of this morning, according to the report. A person close to Mr. Bannon insisted the parting of a ways was his idea and that he had submitted his resignation last Monday. I think he was the leaker? Monday. Do you think that has something to do with it? Well, I mean, I don't the think it's true that for us to speculate on yeah, any of that. Say. What we can do is report the facts. President Trump told senior aides that he had decided to remove Bannon um, and, and that who helped Mr. Trump actually win the 2016 election. And this is according to two administration officials uh, inside that discussion telling the New York Times this. So there were people apparently in the room as this discussion was going on. That's an important fact, too, because one thing we do know is that we will find out probably in short order if there were a couple people who talked about this. Now, remember, when Anthony Scaramucci, the, right. the uh, minute-long communications director, yeah. <laughs> uh, came back onto the scene, he was very critical of Steve Bannon very publicly, saying, you know, he felt that this that he should have been removed. And the back and forth that we now know that existed between yeah. Bannon and other people on the staff is coming out. But to your point, exactly. I, I, I think you've nailed it. And Anthony Scaramucci was removed when, you know, General John Kelly came in as, as chief of staff. He had what he thought, he claims he thought, was an off-the-record conversation uh, with the New Yorker reporter. And now Steve Bannon had a very similar, he claims he thought it was also an off-the-record conversation. Right. I'm reading about uh, that now. Reported with, with Robert that was Putner. his parting gift. Yeah, exactly. But there, there were some incendiary things in there that when I saw that break, I, I thought to myself, well, He's this out. is absolutely it. General Kelly is going to look at this and, and say to himself, we cannot have these people who are in charge of messaging and policy in the White House talking to reporters in these terms in this way. And remember what uh, President Trump said standing at the first floor of Trump Tower just a couple days ago, refusing to guarantee Bannon's job security, but defended him saying his words, he's not a racist, and called him a friend. But he did end his comments by saying, we'll see what happens Look, with Mr. Bannon. He I don't also think said the, the same thing about James Comey. He said right. the same thing about Ryan Priebus before. Go ahead, Lauren. I, I don't think the president wanted uh, Bannon out of the White House uh, for Why political not? reasons, because you don't want Steve Bannon now uh, controlling a conservative media. I'm sorry. Well, well, and that's what I'm, you know, that's what I've been reading for a couple of weeks about this whole thing. It's like, so how do you handle this very prickly situation with Steve Bannon? Because he can hurt you if he goes and wide. And he will. And doesn't agree with you. But, so how do you keep that? And are they as close as the president had said? And maybe that's something that you don't have to worry about. But you about. also might have some problems within the base. And the Trump coalition is 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 already, you know, a little bit weakened by what's happened. Some people have, have drawn closer to him. Other people were, um, you know, put off by what happened last week. But there are economic nationalists, not racial nationalists, economic nationalists who really 
felt good about Bannon being in, in the White House. And so I think President Trump is going to have to reassure that part of his base. I so, think but he here. also you had know, some very curious things to say about North Korea. And, you know, when, when his uh, personal ideas That's on solving point. that crisis run completely contrary to your, defar your Department of Defense, uh, then, you know, you have to consider who you've got in your close inner circle. So you and are thinking it. the same thing right now, Kennedy. So what's happening simultaneously to this information? The president is at Camp David reportedly talking about what to do about North Korea yeah. and national security with regard to North Korea as we speak. And, and our ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, as well as the Secretary of State and uh, the Secretary of Defense have all said so military options are on the table. All options have to be on the table. And uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis's comments reflected what the president so what yes. the American people tell us is, What this might tell us just based on the facts of that meeting going on right now at Camp David, what we know Steve Bannon had said about North Korea and what's transpired right. this week is it's probably a confluence of things. It's probably almost many, definitely. Probably, most I don't think what he said left. about North Korea was all that controversial. All he really said was, hey, look, it, no, it, it lies in the, the hands of China. Some of the others who, are, who reportedly will be at yeah, this meeting. He should have went on the record about it. We're not in the room right now, but yes. been working in the White House. And also, I think he's run out of allies. Right, right. You know, yeah. if, if, and he was undermining the White House, it seems like. Anthony Scaramucci said from the very beginning when he got in there that Bannon was well, one of the leakers. we can't repeat what he called him. Or what he said that he can't talk about that. We can't even, I just yeah, feel like it's very shady that the leak, the leaker was next to the president the entire time, and it if seems it like it. Him. Does well, this help the president? How does this help the president? Well, I, I do. I, I think that it help, helps the president. I, I feel like it does. I think Bannon was a problem from the very beginning. It did help him in the beginning because uh, you know you got that part of the base to support the president as a result. But now I think it's time to part ways. Uh, but he will go after the president now that he's going to be back in control of his media. You seem so sure of that. Okay, but, but I have a question close. about that, and and I don't know what the answer to this is. So people who advise the president, people who have these incredibly close roles, do they sign non-disclosure agreements? Is is there something that you have to sign when you work for the president that says that you, you know, you will not take certain jobs? Well, the president people write books, so right. I mean, they, they must be, there must be some leeway there. Yeah. Um, this real quick. So from that interview that Steve Bannon said he thought was off the record, which is such a trend now. <laughs> you on, leave man. the White House you and still then you leave, like an off the record thing. He said, quote, ethno-nationalism, it's losers. It's a fringe element, Bannon said. I think the media placed it up too much and we got to help crush it, you know. Uh, help crush it more. These guys are a collection of clowns. And of course, that's the one quote that has really been out there. Wh why do you think he says that in an interview, Rachel, right out the door? Well, I, I, listen, I think Steve Bannon could um, hurt him, like you said, mm -hmm. but I also think um, that they are probably close friends. And I don't think that he wants to. This is if Steve Bannon really wanted to see his economic nationalist agenda happen, mm. um, why would he hurt the person who can bring it about? So I just wanted to say that we about? now have uh, confirmed Fox News, John Roberts, Chief White House Correspondents, confirmed per his source uh, that Steve Bannon is out at the White House. We're trying to source him on the White House front lawn uh, to get more on this because we'll remind everybody that we the last time we saw President Trump was early this hour uh, landing and heading to Camp David. So John Roberts is in studio right now. John Roberts. Steve Bannon out. What can you tell us? Yes, Sandra. I mean, this is something that's been rumored for an, an awfully long, 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 awfully long. Okay. So, all right. Well, <laughs> that's a bit of a all right. There. Um, obviously, live television. We'll try to get him back, um, but he has confirmed this news. So, I, I want to go back to this question, though, about what Steve Bannon was saying about the recent events, because yeah. it, it, it seemed to. I don't know what he normally would have said, but he's saying this in something he says was off the record. But he was also clearing his name. I don't know if you guys, because yeah. people were painting him as the racist in right. the White House. So now he's saying we must crush <laughs> yeah. this. We must right, right, right. Like stronger language than the president was using. At that time. Exactly. Okay, yeah. uh, John Roberts, are you good now, sir? We'd love to hear what you have. I, I thought I was good before, Sandra. But you were excellent, yeah, John. Yeah. Um, so listen, you know, I mean, Steve Bannon is one of the people who was closest to the president ideologically, if not personally. The president has said that he came into the campaign late, uh, but that uh, he was clearly a force uh, during the campaign and a force there at the White House. But we are now told by two sources that Steve Bannon will be leaving the White House. Uh, I was communicating uh, with him this morning on some, some other issues, 
Uh, he uh, deferred when I asked him whether or not he was uh, coming or going. But uh, it looks like the president has decided uh, after a review that was conducted by his chief of staff, John Kelly, uh, to remove Steve Bannon from his position as his chief strategist. Uh, it's also likely, too, that this is just the first shoe to drop. I mean, there is, you know, it's no secret, although the White House has really kind of tried to paper over it, but it's no secret that there have been a number of rivalries in the White House. Uh, there was uh, Steve Bannon, sometimes against Reince, Reince Priebus, sometimes allied with Reince Priebus against some of the other factions in the White House, including Jared Kushner and Gary Cohen. So uh, I, I don't know for sure, Sandra, but I would think that uh, this is not the last departure that we're going to hear of uh, from this White House. Now, a lot of people, by the way, have said that Steve Bannon is the president's connection to the base. In some ways, he is, but he's also got Kellyanne Conway, who uh, very much is in touch with the president's base, as well as women in the Republican Party. And so the fact that Steve Bannon is, is leaving will be a loss for the president, but he does have some other backup there in terms of maintaining that connection to the base and uh, certainly to Republican women, Sam. I uh, just wanted to get this in here, reporting from Catherine Herridge, uh, saying in her intelligence context says he learned about 40 minutes ago about this news from a senior Republican Party source, saying concerns for Republican Party believes continued fallout with General Kelly played a role in all of this. John? Yeah, and, you know, General Kelly doesn't have the easiest job around uh, either. You know, he comes from a military background. He, he is well-versed in politics in terms of him being the political liaison chief of staff for uh, the secretaries of defense, Leon Panetta, as well as uh, Robert Gates. Uh, but don't forget, you're dealing with Donald Trump here, and there's only so much you can do to try to keep uh, the president's uh, ship on course, to keep that train rolling down the tracks before you quickly become persona non grata in, in the president's eyes. And some people that I've been talking to uh, say that what the president did earlier this week in that bizarre press conference in Trump Tower was in a way to say to General Kelly, well, you may be trying to control me, but I'm the one who's going to control me. Let's not forget you're the chief of staff. You work for me. I am the boss. Uh, so General Kelly, I think, is, is he's, he's probably got a very tough challenge there. If he thought that going into Iraq in 2003 wow, was a yeah. challenge when he was <laughs> with First Marines, he's got a real challenge on his hands. Yeah. And he goes from Department of Homeland Security, which is a thankless job, and one that keeps you up all night now to being the chief of staff for this well, president. Well, we, we so thank him for his service. Uh, real quickly, because we're pressing up against the top of the hour. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit, you alluded to a trend. So you've got uh, Hope Hicks mm -hmm. coming in for Scaramucci's mm -hmm. job. You've got Sarah Huckabee Sanders coming in for Spicer. Uh, it seems to be uh, a little bit of a trend, maybe an evolution of women taking the mantle. It will be interesting to see if Kellyanne Conway or another woman is in line uh, for what is now clearly a job opening in inside the White House as uh, Steve Bannon exits. I can't let you answer because we were pressed up against the hour, but I'm so grateful for you joining us, John Robertson. I know you're going to stay on the breaking news here on Fox News Channel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Harris. Uh, Lawrence Jones, it was a Thank pleasure you. to have you. I hope you had a good time. It was. It was Say fun. hello to the family and friends down in Big D, Wait, Texas. You said it was fun, so you're coming back, huh? I'm coming yeah? back. All right. They allow me. All right. <laughs> Rachel, you wore this at the Republican National Convention, and you wore it so beautifully today. And Thank you. In your dress. Thanks for being here. Thanks so All much. All right, everybody. We will see you tomorrow. Uh, no, Monday, noon Eastern. Woo! This felt like a, a weekday. It is. <laughs> Happening now starts now. Uh, Fox News alert on another big shakeup at the White House. President Trump has decided to remove his controversial uh, chief strategist, Stephen Bannon. Mm. Yeah, uh, apparently he found out about 40 minutes ago. Uh, some new details continue to emerge as we decide or, or determine what's going to happen next. Normally, Friday afternoons <laughs> are the time when you make big personnel changes in Washington. Uh, this one came relatively early. Kevin Cork is at the White House for us. Uh... <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. He is in Bedminster, New Jersey. It's the operating White House while the president is there. Uh, Kevin, tell us about the departure of Stephen Bannon. 
Boy, let me tell you, uh, first, we're actually very close to Camp David, my friend. We've been following the president sort of bounce around. You're certainly to be uh, forgiven. We're uh, in suburban uh, Maryland here, not terribly far from Camp David and not, frankly, very far from the nation's capital, where once again, the center of the political world is focused. Steve Bannon is out. We had heard rumblings. You may have seen yesterday in that wide-ranging interview with the American prospect, Bannon really seemed to take some shots at not only some administration officials, but certainly he seemed to depart from what the president was saying about North Korea. Now, we're not suggesting, and you heard John Roberts say as much, that that in and of itself was enough to move him out of the job. But make no mistake about it, Steve Bannon's departure is in part driven by the fact that the president has never felt like he was somehow the puppet master. You may remember what Time Magazine called him, the great manipulator. Remember that, that cover? Well, it certainly didn't make the president happy. And as uh, John and others have now been reporting, Steve Bannon is out. This does not come as a great surprise. We certainly hope to get much more information about his departure as we continue our coverage here on Fox News this afternoon. As for the president, of course, here at uh, Camp David, which is very nearby, he's got some major discussions to have with his national security senior cadre. Now, uh, we're we're talking some very big names here, more than a dozen folks and some big names, of course, that people at home would know, like Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Mattis, uh, Nikki Haley, among others, Rex Tillerson, even Jeff Sessions among those who will be there, as well as H.R. McMaster. And if you know about the battle sort of between McMaster and Bannon, uh, that is uh, obviously pretty interesting as well. Now, they're here to talk about a number of major issues, including North Korea, the ongoing missile crisis there, John. What exactly is the next step? and how best to prevent North Korea from getting the ultimate weapon. That plus we also expect to hear them talk about the president's domestic security agenda and that will certainly include the border. Keep in mind the president next week will be talking about that at length. He's going to again get conversation not just on the strategic side but the legal side about the ongoing fight to secure America's border. And speaking of the fight, how about the extended protracted fight in Afghanistan? A war that is now America America's longest 17 years, trillions of dollars, and thousands of lives. What is the best move forward from there? How on earth can we end the bloodshed and extract America from its longest war ever? Here's what the president had to say about the planning of this meeting just a few days ago. He said, and I'm going to tell you just uh, very quickly that the president said, uh, look, uh, we're going to take a very close look at it. Now, what does he mean by that? Simply speaking, uh, he's been in concert uh, with a lot of people who feel like enough is enough for America in terms of what it has extended and uh, spent, frankly, in that region of the world. But will that line up, John, with what his generals have to say? We'll see what uh, General Mattis and others, of course, will tell him about that. Maybe we get a good readout. We'll all be watching very carefully. But clearly, the big story at this hour Steve Bannon is out, and of course we'll continue uh, to circle around that story and we'll bring you all the latest details as we get it, but for now back to you my friend. Uh, Kevin, this is Heather. I had one question for you. Do we have any additional information as to how Steve Bannon was told? I know we had the one report that says he was told about 40 minutes ago. Uh, do we know how he was told and do we know anything about the president's uh, reaction or mood at this point regarding it? Yeah, good question, Heather. We don't have a sense of the president's mood about this, but I really think the president tipped his hand uh, in talking about Steve Bannon uh, just the other day when he said, listen, uh, Mr. Bannon joined the campaign late. Again, sort of deflecting this idea that somehow he was the main force behind the Trump train. He also said he's a good man and we'll see. Remember when he said that? I think that uh, laid it out right there that we kind of felt like the writing was on the wall. What does that mean in terms of how soon did Bannon find out maybe after those comments that he was out of a job? Or did it happen, uh, happen suddenly? I've been doing what I should do, and that is checking my phone, <laughs> texting back and forth with administration officials. I don't have tons of uh, guidance to share with you. Let me just double check and make sure I didn't get anything during this live shot. Uh, we'll let you know. So uh, I don't have anything more, but as I get it, certainly I promise I'll pass it along to you, Heather. All right, Kevin, we'll check back with you. Thanks. Kevin Cork stays on top of things. He sure you know does. It. Joining us now on the phone, Dana Perino, former White House press secretary under George W. Bush and co-host of The Five here on Fox News Channel. Uh, Dana, when, when people hear about this palace intrigue, you know, uh, chairs being shuffled around uh, in, in the Oval Office, they, they might not think it affects them, and maybe it doesn't. What, in your view, does the departure, the departure of Steve Bannon mean to this administration? 
I think a couple of things, John. First, I do think that it is true for a company, as it is for the government, that personnel is policy. And so the team is very important, and who you have there is important. I think that um, this is a continuation of General John Kelly helping the president refocus the White House team. And I'm going to give you three B words. Steve Bannon had become a distraction because he was getting a lot more attention even than the president. You saw that even at the president's frustration with um, that book that Joshua Green of Bloomberg wrote. There was also reportedly distrust amongst the White House staff when it came to leaks and the belief that Steve Bannon was leaking about them and their colleagues, their friends. And third, I would say destruction. Steve Bannon had reportedly said he did not plan to be at the White House for longer than 8 to 12 months. Well, you know, it's August. It's the eighth month of the presidency. And he hit his deadline. But I also think that when it comes to destruction, when he called the Robert Kuttner, the reporter of the American Prospect the other day, and just laid it all out there and really basically undermined President Trump on his North Korea policy, I think that was probably the final straw for the president. And for his chief of staff, General John Kelly, who is a military man uh, after all, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for, for him to read those words from Steve Bannon that essentially there is no military solution to the North Korean problem. That's what Bannon had to say. And for General Kelly, um, well, that, that's not acceptable. Well, and, it, and also because if you're the president, you had just told North Korea that you will fight with fire and fury. And that was a successful move because North Korea backed down. They did not shoot missiles at Guam this week. And you also got China from a diplomatic standpoint to push back against North Korea. So I think that this is just a resettling of the White House. I've never seen um, this much change within a personnel in the White House. But I think that this is probably going to be good especially for the staff. And apparently, Steve Bannon says he's prepared to help the president with his agenda when he's outside of the White House as well. Um, we'll see if that's helpful or hurtful. I don't know if this week that Bannon's advice was helpful to the president in dealing with the aftermath of Charlottesville, but time will tell. That's what I was actually going to ask you, Dana. Um, do you think that this is also an effort to distance the administration from the you know, alt-right nationalists because, of course, Steve Bannon was connected to that? Well, so, yes, um, when Bannon was head of Breitbart, he said that he is, was providing a platform for the alt-right. And I had said on the five, I think that the president would not pay a political price if he distanced himself from the alt-right. And in some ways, symbolically, yes, that's look, it could be the case. But I actually think that the firing, whether it was a firing or a resignation, is still in question. The New York Times is reporting that Steve Bannon uh, submitted his resignation on August 7th. And the president had waited to decide what he was going to do. He doesn't like conflict in his inner circle. And I do think that he appreciates some of the work that Steve Bannon had done to help get him to the presidency. But he wants to be the main event. Um, and regardless of what an advisor can tell a president to do, the president himself or herself in the future, they are the ones responsible for what they say. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this will help in the future uh, in regards to dealing with crises of like the one that we saw in this past week, but certainly for the country, I hope so. Let me read a quote from an Associated Press uh, piece written apparently by Carolyn Castor. She writes, one White House source twists the knife. His, meaning Bannon's departure, may seem turbulent in the media, but inside it will be very smooth. He has no projects or responsibilities to hand off. And that's a way of <laughs> yeah, saying Yeah, that's that, a sick burn right yeah, there. That's what yeah. they call that, John. That's, that's somebody who's... <laughs> In the Oval it means Office, that you are, Ouch. it means you are so irrelevant to the operation that it doesn't matter if you leave. But please go. You are a distraction. We don't trust you. And you have been destructive to the White House and to the party. And so it will be better if you're not here. At this point in time, when so many Republican senators and members of Congress are so critical of the president for his handling of the Charlottesville incident, um, does the departure of Steve Bannon hold out? hope that that maybe there will be a a little less rancor within the republican party well that's a curious thing john because actually during the health care debate as i understood it um steve bannon was actually trying to be pretty helpful um when it didn't pass initially in the house there was some grumbling that um steve bannon had said you are obligated to uh, vote with this president and his agenda and some members of congress took umbrage at that but yet it when it moved on and it finally passed the House and then it was getting 
through the Senate. Of course, that ultimately failed. But apparently, a lot of members of Congress felt like they could actually get a phone call returned from Steve Bannon. And he was somebody that uh, you could work with. So mm-hmm. I don't know if members of Congress will think that it will be easier or harder to work with the White House now without Steve Bannon. But I don't think he was entirely unhelpful to this president. I think that he did some good work for him, if you're looking at it from President Trump's point of view. Uh, Dana, there's some information that has just uh, come our way from Doug McElway. Apparently there, and this is in, not entirely unexpected, uh, 19 different conservative groups are protesting the removal of Bannon and then possibly uh, Kellyanne Conway as well. Do you think that she's next? Oh, goodness. I, um, I certainly have not heard that at all. And in fact, she was um, utilized today very effectively by the White House to um, give some context and information for reporters this morning. So I certainly haven't heard that about Kellyanne Conway. And I think one of the things that Steve Bannon wanted to do is he just, he could not stand the establishment. And he exposed the establishment for what he thought it was. And he helped drive division within the Republican Party, maybe division that was going to be inevitable, but he drove it through. Um, You know, you hear that there's possibly other people out at the White House. Politico is reporting that the head of public liaison is going to be out. This, again, could just be the resettling after General John Kelly took over as chief of staff, or it could mean that there are more departures to come because of concerns of leaks or whatever. Um, But I certainly haven't heard that about Kellyanne Conway and and wouldn't believe that. Hmm. We just saw a. You call me back in two hours. Yeah. <laughs> we just saw a um, an acting uh, communications director appointed. Hope Hicks took the job yeah. at the ripe old age of 28. Now, you know, if if you're Steve Bannon and you're calling up uh, American Prospect and and railing about the things he railed about North Korea and the alt right and so forth, is that the kind of thing that a communications director wants to rein in? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is. You know, if there had been a, uh, an established person in that position, would Bannon have felt free to pick up the phone? Possibly not, but I think the person who would most would want uh, Steve Bannon not to make that phone call is the president of the United States. Right. So that was really the egregious part. Um, I think that Hope Hicks could do a really good job. I mean, she obviously has the ear of the president. I understand she has a motto of let Trump be Trump, which could be good or could mm-hmm. lead to more... Uh, stories like the ones we've had this week, um, that job is so important. One of the most important things you have to be is an honest broker for everybody at the White House because everyone will have a different point of view for a policy or how it should be communicated, and you have to be the one that makes a final decision. And it's a lot of long-range planning. It's not day-to-day press work. That's actually the job of Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Well, and speaking of the press secretary, we do have one official statement right now. It just came in from the White House, and it says, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly and Steve Bannon have mutually agreed today would be Steve's last day. We're grateful for his service and wish him the best. Short little statement there, but says a lot. Yeah, (laughs) short and sweet, or not so sweet, depending on who you are. Dana, if you'd be good enough to stick with us, we want to go back to our chief White House correspondent, John Roberts, for just a moment for any updates there might be in the headline of the hour that Steve Bannon is out at the White House, the president's chief strategist. Let's go to our chief White House correspondent. John Roberts. John? Hey, hey, John. And of course, this, along with Ryan's previous firing, uh, was long rumored to kind of be in the works. How long would Steve Bannon last? It looked for a while like he was going to hang in. But then that uh, that discussion that he had with the uh, with the writer from American Prospect really kind of appeared to seal the deal, at least in General John Kelly's eyes, that uh, perhaps uh, Steve Bannon wasn't exactly uh, a, a team player in the way that Kelly would need people who were inside the White House to be a team player. And uh, so, as uh, the White House says, it was mutually agreed upon by General Kelly, the new chief of staff, and Steve Bannon that he would uh, be departing the White House, that today uh, would be his last day. Uh, The New York Times is reporting that uh, he had tendered a resignation a couple of weeks ago on August 7th. Uh, We're looking into whether or not uh, he had uh, left that resignation with the president for him to decide on or or whether he decided uh, that he maybe wanted to try to... uh, 
to get the resignation letter back, but it, it would appear as though with discussions with John Kelly, uh, Steve Bannon is out. We've also confirmed, and Dana Perina mentioned this, that the head of the Office of Public Liaison, George Safakis, is out today as well. He was an ally of Reince Priebus's. Uh, th this is not a surprise. This is something that's been in the works, I'm told, uh, for a while uh, now at the White House, probably more linked to Reince Priebus's departure than Steve Bannon's departure. Uh, so they'll be looking for a new chief strategist. If they replace him, they'll also be looking for a new uh, person to run the Office of Public Liaison. The big question is, and you heard Doug McElway's reporting that a number of conservative groups are protesting uh, Bannon's ouster at the White House. What kind of an effect is this going to have on the president? Uh, Bannon was widely seen as being a link between the president and a very strong element of his base, though there are other people in the White House, Kellyanne Conway among them, who have links to the base as well, and stronger links with women than Steve Bannon would. So we don't really know what the political upshot of that is going to be right now. Uh, I would say, though, they do have some time uh, to work that out. Uh, there's still a little more than three years to go before the next election is held, maybe a couple of years before they start to actively campaign. But there's no question that Bannon was well respected by many people in the conservative side of the Republican Party. He was very anti-establishment, so much so and so much of a populist that he was a real lone voice in the wilderness on the tax reform proposal where he said he wanted the top tax bracket for people who were making more than five million dollars a year to start with a four and there was nobody else to my knowledge in the senior staff at the white house that was pushing anything like that so and we did spend some time with steve bannon back in the hundred days mark uh, we were in his office for about an hour and a half and it was literally a war room inside there he had whiteboards up on two of the walls with all of the proposals and policy agenda items that he wanted to get passed there were a few check marks up on that wall, but the majority of what he wanted to get through uh, still uh, remained up there without a check mark on it. So there are probably some people who will say, well, just how effective was he? And was he more of a divisive figure than he was a unifying figure at the White House or, or in terms of a figure who was uh, getting things done at the White House, John? So I think, you know, the final story was Steve Bannon, uh, his tenure there at the White House, as well as how his departure came about still to be written. But we're uh, checking with some folks on the ladder, and uh, we'll report back to you just as soon as we find out. All right. John Roberts, our chief White House correspondent. Rob, uh, John, thank you. Yeah, I think we still have Dana Perino on the phone. Uh, Dana, if you're still standing by, um, you know, what do you make of actually replacing Steve Bannon? Because, you know, the Steve or the chief strategist position was something that we hadn't really seen before President Trump. Well, actually, Karl Rove um, in our administration was considered the senior strategist. And possibly, I think, in the Obama administration, it was Valerie Jarrett. I think it's an important position because, as John was just reporting, you know, you look at the promises the president made in a campaign, the policies he wants to achieve. You build that up against the calendar and you try to decide how can we best help the president achieve his or her goals. So I think that a chief strategist is actually a very good one. And not to add anything more to her plate, but I sort of feel like Kellyanne Conway already plays that role to a large extent, and I know she's got many different hats that she's wearing right now, but in many ways, I think she is uh, perfect for the role of chief strategist for the president. I want to point out that uh, the major stock averages are up, Dana, on the news that Steve <laughs> Bannon is out. It's funny how this stuff works, but the Dow Jones was down about 109 points this morning until around 11.15 Eastern time when it was announced, Axios first broke the story that uh, today would be Steve Bannon's last day, the online uh, Washington covering news service. And right around 11.15, the Dow Jones went into positive territory and it is up right now, just a couple of points. So um, Wall Street seems to like the departure of the president's now former chief strategist, Dana. Well, I feel that I don't know enough anything about markets really, but. Um what people look for, and I understand markets like, is certainty. And so there's been this question out there for about a month, will Steve Bannon stay or go after Ryan Priebus left? And the president even answering a question about it this week, not recalling him Steve, remember, calling him Mr. Bannon, which I thought was a tell that Steve Bannon was probably not going to uh, be at the White House much longer. When the article came out this week after Steve Bannon called um, the American prospect and laid it all out there and then said, oh, gosh, I didn't know I was going to be on the record, um, I thought that that was um, Steve Bannon saying, I'm ready to go, and I feel like I've done all I can do here. Um, and a 
apparently there is also reporting now. I, I can't confirm it, but there's reporting that he will be returning to Breitbart. And that was from a source close to Bannon, but of course I'm not, I, I can't confirm that. Well, we need to let you save some of your thoughts for the five later on tonight. <laughs> Dana Perino, who served thank as a... Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Dana, of course, was press secretary for George W. Bush and uh, knows well the inner workings of, of a White House and yeah. how the key players operate. Although it was not quite like this. No, it was not. <laughs> Never seen this before. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz is a retired Green Beret commander and a former counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Cheney and a Fox News contributor. Thank you very much for joining us. So, My pleasure. Today's developments, uh, Steve Bannon right. out, uh, what do you think that means for the administration in terms of foreign policy? Well, you know, and, and having worked around and, and with John, General John Kelly, the, the new White House Chief of Staff, he was a former combatant commander over Southern Command. He was a former key military aide to the Secretary of Defense, and he's used to running a tight military ship. And I can tell you also, having worked in the White House for Vice President Cheney, actually the same time as, as Ms. Dana Perino. Uh, look, you're there as staff. Uh, you're there to advise the president with the best possible advice and to be very candid with your own views. But when the president makes a, a decision, everybody gets into lockstep and you don't outshine uh, the principal. And you know, in my view, as part of the interview that Bannon did earlier, this week and basically pulling the military option off the table or saying, hey, I'm everybody knows he's very close to President Trump and just on the heels of the fire and fury comment and that, hey, China, hey, Kim Jong Un, we are serious this time. Uh, we mean it. And this is a real option here that we are not going to allow a nuclear uh, uh, East Asia. We're not going to allow a nuclear North Korea. And then to essentially undermine that just days later as we're starting to get into more of a diplomatic effort, I think for, for General Kelly as the chief of staff was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. What do you make of his comments? I mean, it did not make any sense at all, first of all, to, to do that interview and say that yeah. you thought it was off the record. He knows better. But his comments about China and, and Korea, also the enemies that he claimed to have in the administration. Well, I think, you know, I mean, look, this goes to the, the kind of populist movement that Bannon represents and I think is a real force uh, within the Republican Party and within our political body. Because remember, the president won with a lot of working Democrats coming over. And part of that is losing jobs to China, losing jobs overseas. And I think Bannon is right in pressing that we are, to a large degree, at an in with in economic warfare uh, with China for who is going to be the predominant economy around the world. And that goes to things as basic as, as the dollar being the basic currency overseas versus something else. So I think he's right in that being a key part of mm -hmm. his focus. But I don't necessarily agree with all the solutions in terms of kind of retrenching rather than looking at how to beat China at its own game. Hmm. Do you think that that was basically a, a version of an exit interview that he gave to the American yeah, prospect? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, if you believe the, the reporting that's out there, he tendered his resignation, what, last week? I think we said uh, August so, 6th, I think. Yeah, right. Um, or, yeah, even, even earlier. So mm -hmm. it could have been. But, you know, keep in mind as well, there are other key events going on in terms of the president and his national security team meeting today to try to finally come to the way forward for the strategy within Afghanistan. There was apparently... You know, a real heated back and forth between Mr. Bannon and General McMaster over the way forward there. So I think he was just clashing with so many folks and then being seen as kind of rising above uh, the president in terms of who the real strategist is and who the decision maker is that, I, I, you know, I see General Kelly's fingerprints on this of like we cannot uh, support the president effectively as one voice moving forward as as a U.S. government when we have all of these outliers. So in terms of uh, General Kelly, what do you think this signals for the entire communications department moving forward? Well, I think it goes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier. Look, in private, you know, we can, we can yell at each other. We can have real disagreements. You can storm out of the room. You know, apparently there was, there was a story going around about General Kelly sending two staffers out of the room to, to hash it out when they were talking about some trade uh, policy with China. But once you present those various options to the president and he makes a decision, that's it. 
uh, you move forward and you support the president and his views. And that's really, you know, not only just supporting the president, but that's supporting the country. Uh, to have different messages going to an adversary like Russia, like China, like North Korea is truly dangerous. And if you think about the soldiers that are out on the pointy end of that spear who also see the media uh, and, 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 and see this kind of different guidance coming out, it can be quite confusing and it can really harm morale. You know, we were discussing earlier um, with Dana Perino the, this actual position yeah. of the chief strategist. It was different in the Trump administration because of the uh, level of access and, and the responsibilities of the chief strategist had been heightened. Who do you think would replace him if the spot is replaced? Would, do you think that uh, General Kelly would bring in somebody else from the military? Well, no, I think, I think Dana's right in that Kellyanne Conway is already, you know, essentially in that role. Uh, it is an important role, and I've told, you know, a lot of folks going into this new National Security Council and this new team working for General McMaster that, look, we can put, and you guys can put great policy forward, but you have to understand that once it leaves the National Security Council and enters into the Oval Office, there are all kinds of other cross currents that are going to come there. There's the congressional piece, there's the political piece with, um, with the president's campaign promises, there's his broader coalition, it's how it's going to be communicated, and I think that chief strategist role is very important to keep the president on track with not only the coalition that got him there, but but it, you know already looking forward to re-election. Yeah, and it's interesting. These uh, 19 conservative groups who have sent this letter to the White House um, against him being released uh, seem to be concerned that uh, Kellyanne Con Conway may be next. So they're trying to put that out in advance. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate sure. it. Sure. Okay. Thanks so much. Let's bring in Ed Martin, president of the Eagle Forum Fund, former state GOP chairman of the Missouri Republican Party and author of The Conservative Case for Trump, and Leslie Marshall, Fox News contributor and host of the syndicated radio show, The Leslie Marshall Show. So, Leslie, as you watch uh, the departure of Steve Bannon from this White House, what comes to your mind as to the immediate effect? Well, first of all, I think it alienates some of the extremely uh, conservative base uh, that uh, the president has. And when I say conservative, uh, I'm sorry, that alt-right uh, portion of the conservative base, because remember, Steve Bannon is certainly one of the people who is extremely influential in getting the president elected. But like I said during the campaign, a campaign is not a presidency, and we're seeing that now. Uh, I also think it shows the uh, strength of uh, of of Kelly and his position and his influence. And I also think it does show, uh, because this is becoming a pattern, that the president does not like infighting. And as we know, Mr. Bannon did not get along and play nice with everyone. And additionally, uh, very irresponsible to have a conversation uh, that should have clearly been said off the record on August 16th with the American prospect when he granted that interview. Um, so I, 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 definitely, I definitely think this shows that there's somebody there saying, hey, you haven't been able to rein in this president that you got to be president, because I think Steve Bannon was keeping Donald Trump much like the campaigner Donald Trump and not the president that he is now with the uh, no filter, unhinged, if you will, tweeting and uh, speeches that we have heard uh, most recently. Ed, we mentioned you are the author of the conservative case for Trump. Are you sorry to see, yeah. see Steve Bannon go? Well, I, I, I think Steve Bannon's one of the mo more talented people that I've seen in politics and policy. And, I, you know, I worked for Phyllis Schlafly, the late Phyllis Schlafly. She admired Steve his, at Breitbart, his, his not only communication skills, but he's a real policy guy. So I think I'm sorry he's go leaving because he's talented. But I got to tell you guys, this proves yet again Donald Trump is in charge. Donald Trump, no one else gets to call the shots. Nobody is, is a, he's not a Manchurian candidate. And I think Steve Bannon will be the first. If you know politics and if you know real leadership. When the boss says go, you salute, you submit a resignation last week, and you go. And Bannon will contribute. And conservatives, I'm, I'm an arch conservative. I'm not unhappy with anything other than the fact that the president is being tied up by too many moderates in the Republican Party from getting more of his agenda. But Steve did a great job. He'll be a great uh, player wherever he is. And it's, um, you know, it's the President Trump is in charge, and it, it's great for the country. There are rumblings that he intends to return to Breitbart, uh, where he'll obviously so. obviously have quite a platform. 
Uh, what if yeah. what if his positions there don't agree with this White House? I mean, what if essentially there there becomes some kind of a war between Breitbart and the Trump administration? Well, if you're asking me, Steve Bannon, when he was at Breitbart, he disagreed with lots in the party. He disagreed with Trump periodically. I think you saw that. We, most good people, I think Trump is good. I think everybody on this show is good. Want to get better things happening. When they disagree, they'll disagree. And I think um, I don't think that will be a war. I think it'll be a disagreement about the direction of the country, and we'll see where it goes. I, you know, wh this is playing out in Alabama, by the way. Roy Moore is sort of more conservative, and Senator Strange is less. But Senator Strange worked with President Trump, so there's disagreement. Agreements, that's okay, right? The progress is for America first because our country has been really stuck and our people have been stuck, and Trump is bringing us out of that. It's, it's, um, it's all good from where we're sitting out here in the conservative heartland. All right. L Leslie, would you agree with that assessment? No, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. Um, I, I, I think that the president uh, does and says what's best for the president. And I think, uh, quite frankly, some of the very damaging uh, tweets that he has made have been uh, damaging to the country, um, whether you're threatening other nations, uh, you know, with war or, or nuclear war, whether you're saying irresponsible things about wars that uh, did not exist, that imply the slaughter of someone like in a Muslim religion, if you will, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to control ISIS. I mean, the list goes on. I think here what we see is um, a, a, a White House, especially uh, with Secretary Kelly being put in the position to perhaps clean things up a bit, uh, trying to put uh, America first and trying to keep the president on course in the job that he was elected to do and not go uh, off the rails and become unhinged, as we have seen as of late. And I think that Steve Bannon is not in agreement with some, uh, perhaps in the family, like Ivanka, uh, Trump and Jared uh, Kushner and, uh, of course, Secretary Kelly, because they have seen not only the president's poll ratings uh, decrease and the support and people that have said over and over uh, in a New York Times article by one that said, I voted for Trump and, and regret it. Uh, they see this wow, where this, this is headed, not only for the country, but for the future and possible reelection of Donald Trump. I think Ed wants to uh, <laughs> debate you on that well, point. I yeah, I mean, look, this is the same people. This is like Groundhog's Day. It's the same people a few days before the election that said the polls show in Missouri Trump's only going to win by four. He won by 19. The polls are wrong. The American people are sick of the bubble in Washington, in the media, and in the political class. They don't want hate. That's true. But they want a leader who's going to say, you know what? ISIS is evil. We're going to get those guys. We're going to get them no matter what. And North Korea, that guy's a thug, and we're going to fight back. Trump is doing that, and he's putting us over China. And in all you folks that think that something has shifted in America, where the voters are, we're feeling better. Not perfect, but we're feeling better for the first time in a long time. That's what's happening out here. Yeah, the stock market's feeling better. And as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the stock market is feeling better today after the ouster of uh, Stephen Bannon. So that's interesting uh, how they digest that on Wall Street. Ed Martin, Leslie Marshall, thank you both. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Let's bring in Brett Baer, the anchor of Special Report. This was a sort of a slow motion dismissal or resignation. I'm not sure we've ironed out exactly. I guess I guess he did. Steve Bannon did uh, tender his resignation some time ago, and it was finally accepted today, Brett. John, I think this was in the works uh, for some time. Uh, obviously, the president was asked about it on uh, Tuesday, and his words about Steve Bannon were tepid at best. Uh, basically, we'll see. Remember that as chief strategist, Steve Bannon has been the guy that has been trying to keep the president on track when it comes to his campaign pledges, what he promised to do. Steve Bannon had a big whiteboard in his office that had all of the campaign promises and, and pledges that candidate Donald Trump made, and that is one of the things that he was designed uh, to do and wanted to do, was keep those promises front and center. Uh, it became too much in the dynamics of the White House now, but just to set the table here, now the chief strategist is gone, we have seen the chief of staff leave, the press secretary, the deputy chief of staff, the FBI director, the national security advisor, and the communications director. Six months in, to President Trump's time in office. That is a lot of change inside an administration for that short a time. Uh, this was something that had been brewing for some time, we're told. Uh, but you're right, it, it facilitated itself this week. 
Dana Perino was on with us a moment ago and said that uh, that she thought, in in her view, Steve Bannon brought distraction, distrust, and destruction uh, to the White House. Uh, clearly, the president wouldn't have kept him around this long if he didn't like some of what Mr. Bannon had to say. But uh, especially since that interview with American Prospect, he seemed to uh, getting over his head, I guess. Well, there was that interview. He also talked to the New York Times and the Washington Post. And, and clearly he was being put out there or put himself out there either to draw some of the fire fr away from President Trump or to make his final swan song, if you will, before he, uh, he was leaving the White House. Uh, that interview with American Prospect raised a lot of eyebrows here in Washington on a number of fronts. Uh, namely China and the fact that uh, China should be our number one adversary and that everything we do should be pointing to it's either us or them. Uh, and that philosophy, uh, he was feeling that he was taking that to the president and trying to outdo uh, the, his counterparts at state and defense. And also his, his comments about, you know, these Confederate statues and the, the policy at which politically he believed that Democrats uh, continuing to talk about race only helped the Trump administration in the long run politically. And I think there were a lot of people inside the administration who believe that that uh, is not the policy that this president should be following. This departure of Steve Bannon would seem to mark um, the chief of staff, the new chief of cha uh, staff, General John Kelly, putting his stamp and asserting his muscle uh, in, in the Oval Office. I think you can say that, but I do think that this decision uh, was coming from President Trump, who had been hearing uh, from a number of different places that uh, Steve Bannon may be a, a problem for him uh, going forward, uh, inside and outside his administration. Uh, so General Kelly clearly is 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 trying to clean up house and trying to make it orderly. Uh, but I don't know if you put this decision on, on General Kelly as far as this final ouster. Uh, Brett, this is Heather Childers. How do you think this will impact uh, the agenda moving forward? I mean, there's some big things coming up, a tax reform, the budget. How do you think this will impact those? Well, listen, I think there are lawmakers who were pushing uh, to have this happen uh, up on Capitol Hill. If that is somehow an olive branch uh, to them, then perhaps they, they can work a little bit better. This is a tough environment, Heather, after this week, clearly the worst week of, of uh, the president's time in office just by the series of events that happened. And uh, if he can somehow get back to a place where he can work with lawmakers just in the Republican Party, not, not even talking about Democrats, uh, but you have some big things that are going to happen in the next few weeks. The raising of the debt ceiling, uh, the budget, uh, these things deal with the shutting down of government potentially, uh, and he'll need Capitol Hill to get uh, get on its horse. Yeah, the deadline quickly approaching. Yeah, mid-September. Yeah. So, Brett, um, there is apparently no, um, uh, with the departure of Steve Bannon, there is no chief strategist at the White House. Is that a, a job that then falls on Kellyanne Conway, or what are you hearing? Well, I think he's he's got a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen now and a lot of people who feel emboldened, perhaps, in this environment. Who does this politically benefit? It benefits uh, Jared Kushner, uh, his position. He obviously had a rivalry with Steve Bannon at one time. Uh, you have General Kelly, who's in a position of, of authority now and, uh, and has been, and given that by President Trump. And I think there are others who will maneuver themselves into chief strategist Kellyanne Conway among them. Brett Baer, we'll see you tonight on Special Report. No, it is going to be an interesting Friday night program. Thank you. Special Report tonight at 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. All right. So that's a special Special yeah. Report. Two hours there worth. There you go. Thank you. Lots going on, lots to talk about. Uh, Jonathan Shanzer is vice president of research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a former terrorism analyst at the Treasury Department. He joins us now to talk a little bit more about these developments. Obviously, front and center in the news um, is this terrorist attack that happened in Spain. We have um, 13 people dead. We have, what, 24 countries impacted all across the world. How do you think this will impact our um, foreign policy? 
Well, uh, it, I think it reinforces the fact that we're still fighting uh, a jihadism. We're still fighting Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, and in fact, that even as the uh, Trump administration puts the final touches on dislodging uh, ISIS from Syria and Iraq, what we're going to see is a dispersal uh, of many of these jihadi fighters. They're going to be going back to where they came from. So that means going back to countries in the Middle East as well as Europe. And we're going to see, I think, more attacks along the lines of what we saw yesterday in Spain. And this is going to create the need for greater coalition building, uh, greater coordination between this White House and, and our allies across the world. And do you think that this means that we will have a tougher response? Because, you know, Steve Bannon, that's one of the things that he was known to uh, promote. But we also have General John Kelly, who is still there. And we've been talking about, you know, his strength and, and the things that he can accomplish. Sure. I think uh, General Kelly, General McMaster, uh, you've got a, a strong team there, not only on uh, on, on Islamic fundamentalism and, and ISIS and al-Qaeda, but also on issues like Iran and North Korea. I don't think that uh, the team that uh, the president has assembled is going to back down on these issues. I think it'll be interesting to see whether uh, there are nuances or slight shifts in terms of the rhetoric, uh, and that's something we'll just watch for in the coming days. Yeah, and we were just discussing that because the rhetoric seems to, you know, someone says one thing and then another person says another thing. It will be interesting to see if they can coalesce behind, you know, one common message. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Let's check in with our media panel now. Ellen Ratner is bureau chief for Talk Media News and a Fox News contributor. Melissa Quinn is breaking news reporter for the Washington Examiner. Thanks both of you for being here. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah. Melissa, from a media standpoint, um, does the departure of Stephen Bannon, does it, will it quiet down some of the coverage, some of the criticism that's been directed at this White House, especially over the last week? I think that Steve Bannon's departure is really going to play big. I think the big media outlet to look at is going to be Breitbart News. Obviously, he oversaw Breitbart as its chairman, and they have been known to really come to Steve Bannon's defense. But just like you said, Steve Bannon's future and his uh, role with the administration has been, it been a major part of the palace intrigue that we've seen come from the White House really since President Trump's inauguration in January. Obviously, it seems like the hope is that now that he is departing, Parting the White House, maybe this really ends a period of chaos and turmoil for the Trump administration. But that really is the million dollar question as to how that this plays out on the broader uh, media stage. Uh, does, does it quiet some of the criticism that the White House has received, Ellen? I don't think so, actually, because uh, as we know, any CEO, and uh, President Trump is the CEO of that organization, sets the tone. And I think that we are going to see a lot more in palace, you know, in fighting among the palace uh, big shots. I don't think this is going to end it at all. And I think uh, that's, you know, changing decks on the, on the Titanic, changing chairs on the decks of the Titanic are not going to make a difference. I think we're going to just see much more palace intrigue. The president is clearly upset about what happened to him this week. He was excoriated in the press, called it fake news again, and said that the, the press is dishonest about what he said about Nazis, neo-Nazis, and so forth. Melissa, do you want to take that one on? Is he, is he right? <laughs> I mean, I think when you look at his base among Republican voters, there was recent polling that showed that the, the Republican Party, those who supported it, actually approved of the president's response to what happened in Charlottesville. Well, which, but which we response? Know, I think we need to, we need to <laughs> pin that down. I believe CBS News did some polling uh, after the Tuesday press conference at Trump Tower. And what they found was that when asked if the president's response about shifting blame to many sides of those involved in the protests, the large majority of Republican voters, I think it was 68 percent, said that they felt like that they agreed with that statement, that there was blame to go around on both sides. Obviously, President Trump takes a lot of the criticisms from the media very seriously, and that's why he often takes to his Twitter account to excoriate the press. Now, obviously, whether or not he can redeem himself from those comments in future weeks, that's up to him. Uh, James Murdoch, Ellen, who is one of the heads of this organization, um, very publicly said that, you know, there is no such thing as a good Nazi and, and, and really put, put down the president, in effect, for, for failing, uh, in his view, 
um, to state exactly what happened in Charlottesville and how we should respond to it. Um, other media outlets seem to be doing the same thing. Well, we need more James Murdochs uh, to say what they think, because I think that's what's really going to happen here. You're going to have a president who continues to tweet no matter what uh, this new press, uh, sorry, the new uh, chief of staff, Kelly, does. And uh, this is going to continue on. And he, uh, I think that uh, Chief Kelly is going to be very disappointed. I think we have a president who is, as some say, off the rails. Really, off the rails? Well, if you continue to tweet the things that you should not be tweeting, he needs to listen to his staff. If he's going to control what happens and what is said about him in the press, then listen to your staff people. Listen to the people who have been around the bend a longer time than you have, because he's a businessman, and listen to what they have to say. And don't go off message, off rails, whatever you want to say. Don't go off message. Don't tweet. Just listen to what they have to say. And that's how he's going to get positive press. Yeah, Melissa. So there, there did seem to be sort of two different points of view emanating from the president uh, regarding what happened in Charlottesville, and that's what so many in the media found disturbing. Right. I mean, obviously, President Trump faced strong condemnations, not only from congressional Democrats, but from Republicans and members of Republican leadership as well, saying after his Saturday remarks, you need to come out and denounce specifically the white nationalist groups who protested in Charlottesville. President Trump obviously came out and sort of addressed those concerns which with his statement on Monday. But when we saw him give that impromptu press conference at Trump Tower on Tuesday, he completely reverted back back to his orig original comments on the violence in Charlottesville and actually seemed to really double down on his belief that there were very fine people on both sides of the violence there and that there was blame to be placed both on the counter protesters as well as the groups who the white nationalist groups who were protesting the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So I think this really just showed what on Tuesday was that we saw a little snippet into what President Trump really thought about the events in Charlottesville. Ellen, you cover the White House uh, if, after after every departure there, after, you know, Reince Priebus left, after Anthony Scaramucci left, um, after uh, General Flynn left. There are always uh, expectations that things are going to quiet down and that... Um, you know, it'll be a more streamlined, more disciplined, whatever. If I were General Kelly, okay. Chief of Staff Kelly, I would.